You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 47. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and enemies. I'm Shannon McKenna, and I'm the host of the Artist Athlete Podcast and the founder of theartistathlete.com. So um, usually I am pretty good. Actually, for the past year, I have been very good at releasing episodes every single Monday. Um, however, due to some other things going on in my life right now, uh, the podcast is a little less frequent. I want to still release one every week or so, but not necessarily on Mondays. So if you still want to listen instead of having to like go find it each time, go ahead and hit subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. That way you'll know when a new episode comes out, it'll come right to you. Also, this podcast is funded solely by the donations of listeners just like you. Hmm, imagine that through a a website called Patreon. I'm not backed by some huge company. I'm just this one girl uh, with big biceps, and I call up my friends or find different guests that people write into me about, and I ask them questions, and I put all of this all together. So if you like what you're listening to and you want to help me keep going, go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete and send a donation. You can give as little as a dollar and all of the proceeds go to help keeping the lights on in a metaphorical sense since I don't actually live anywhere, so I don't have an electric bill. But I do have bills like paying my editor Derek. Always shout out to Derek. Or um, getting a microphone stand so I don't have to continue to hold this microphone. Things like that are what I take from the Patreon budget, and it is really great to have that as a resource and as a support from all you listeners out there. So again, patreon.com slash theartistathlete. My guest today I met in Seattle back in March when I saw her perform at the Moisture Festival, and I knew I had to have her on the show. Her name is Tina Leonard, and she's a magician, mime, harpist, and classical guitar player. She has performed worldwide and is known for combining elements of pantomime and magic into her acts. For many years, she has been a regular performer at the world-famous Magic Castle in Hollywood, where she has been voted Stage Magician of the Year by the Academy of Magical Arts. This episode I love and this interview I love because it went so far beyond just magic, which is Tina's specialty, and into the realm of act creation and knowing your strengths as a performer and getting scared and living the life that you want to live. So even if you're not a magician, listen in to my interview with Tina Leonard. Start recording because okay. you're already <laughs> saying some fascinating stuff. Okay. Um, is there anything else I want to say? Were you like, comfortable? Are you, you can sit I'm over comfortable. There. Oh, okay. I'm comfortable here. Yeah, okay. I'm like, um, yeah, I'm a floor sitter. So yeah, I'm the same way. People always offer me chairs. I'm yeah. Like, okay. I good. Want... Yeah, I can tell you're a floor sitter because you're in good <laughs> posture. I feel like that's the key. Tina Leonard. Correct. Welcome to the Artist Athlete Thank Podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Yay. <laughs> um, I would love to start by asking you to tell. Or say in your own words Mm -hmm. who you are and what you do. And who I am, too, I suppose. Yeah, who I am and what I do. They're both interchangeable. I'm Tina Leonard. I, oh gosh, I was born in Venezuela to American parents. When I was 12 years old, we moved up here to, I moved to California. And this would have been like around seventh grade. And I was already extremely shy, extremely introverted. So coming into a a school with 2,000 people in it, trying to adjust to the language and to the people and everything was quite difficult, but it was a very interesting challenge. And I discovered that I lo- I had a really strong need for self-expression, but I really didn't have the vehicle to do it. Hmm. So there was a lot of years of trying to figure out this whole thing. At some point, I discovered the guitar. And 
that ended up being my first vehicle of, of self-expression. So I was playing music on the guitar, um, starting out with folk guitar, and then I went on to electric guitar. This is the era of surf music, so I wanted to be a surf guitar player. Uh, <laughs> what does that enjoy, mean? This? Well, surf music. Okay. I never, you know, surfed, but I lived on the beach, <laughs> and we moved to Malibu when I was twelve. Okay. And I was really fascinated with that music, so I managed. My my parents were pretty. My mother was specifically very helpful, very encouraging for me to find ways of expressing myself because she knew that I was not a talker for one thing. I shortly after that switched to classical guitar. Okay. Because that seemed to be, I found that a better way. I when I graduated from high school, I. It was, again, I was on, on a, I was a practical person as well as wanting to express myself. So I realized that being a classical guitarist was probably not going to be a great career choice. I didn't know anyone that was actually <laughs> doing that. So I uh, went to business school to study to be a secretary because I knew that there was oh, work in there. Interesting. So yeah, I, I did that. I, I actually loved it. I enjoyed the, the detail work of it. Hmm. And then I got a job at a mortgage company and I was a secretary. I was a receptionist. And that was okay for a while, but I was starting feeling like this big hole in my heart. I was thinking, I, I don't feel right. I don't think that in 20 years I want to still be doing this. I'm, I, also, I'm always thinking ahead. I always look at people that are 20 years older than me. I still do that. Mm. And I go, okay, what is it about this person that I want to be and not want to be? So I kind of use that as a guidance about where I want to go. So I was just feeling this great need to do something, to find you know, express myself. So I was still playing guitar, but I was kind of my, my little secret thing. And then one day I just said, I've had it. I can't, I just can't do this. I looked in the mirror and I was all dressed up in my secretary clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I can't. So my parents were very encouraging. They said, yeah, we'll, we'll pay for your college. So I went back into college and majored in classical guitar. But even then I, I still had this feeling, well, I'll probably end up being a guitar teacher. That's sort of okay, but at least I'll be playing my instrument. I won't be, you know, someone else's coffee maker. <laughs> right. So uh, that was going to be where I was going to go. And then one day I went to the Renaissance Fair in, in, um, at Paramount Ranch in Malibu. I went to the Renaissance Fair just kind of looking to hear music and things. Because music was always, I think music is always deep inside of me. And I'm, that's, that's where my depth is music. So I, I saw mine. Uh, his name is Robert Shields, who at the time was quite a sensation. Uh, as a street performer. Uh -huh. And I just saw him, and for no reason, I said, what that guy's doing is what I want to do. Came out of nowhere. I'd seen Marceau Marceau when I was a kid, and that made that made a little bit of an impression. So I just said, I got to, that's when I started thinking, I really got to listen to all this inner voice that I don't understand, hmm. but I got to listen to it. And thankfully, my parents were going to, they, they were supportive if they needed to be. So it wasn't like I was completely stuck, but I really wanted to be self-sufficient. So I, he, I found a, a teacher that is uh, in LA, and somehow I started working for me. That I seemed to have that ability to be a mime. <laughs> don't know how that because I don't. I don't like to. I like to express myself, but I don't. I'm not. A, I'm not a speaker. I'm becoming one. But at the time, <laughs> I'm working on being a speaker. That's why I'm doing this with you. <laughs> oh, great! And this is good for me. It's good therapy for me. <laughs> so uh, we formed this little LA mime company, and it was just great. I was able to work with other people, which was nice. And within that, since there was no known employment as a mime, I became a street performer, and I would find places to put my hat out and perform, and it worked. I was actually supporting myself. I was also, since I was in college, I was still teaching classical guitar, so I was doing that, but I had a feeling that was phasing out. But anyway, by the time I was in my early 20s, that's when I made the true discovery that I could do this and that the street performing, I knew that, I didn't know how long that was going to last, but it really gave me a chance to go out and really do the hard stuff where you have to, if, if you don't um, get the audience's attention, then you won't get any money for it. Yeah. It's, like, it's not like a job that you do that you get a paycheck for. So I discovered what works for an audience, how to get an audience. How do you do that as a mime? Because I've had street performers on and obviously I know mm -hmm. some great street performers. Yeah. Um, for a mime, how do you draw an audience? In that time, 
There's two ways. One, you make a lot of noise. Uh huh. Like if you have linking rings, you make a lot of noise and people come around and you play a trumpet or something. The other one is by standing still and not moving. Okay. Now you see a lot of what we call, what do they call? Crate slugs. I hate that term. But people that stand on a crate and don't crate move. Crate slugs. <laughs> I know. I think the term is living <laughs> statues. <laughs> I know. But those of us that have had crate enough slugs. of them. <laughs> and I hope there's no living statues that'll take offense. But especially in Europe. And I mean, that got to be like, too much. Even mine. By the time when I started, mine was still kind of unusual. So I'd be out on the street dressed. I was dressed like a little raggedy Ann doll and I would stand there and people would go, whoa, what's that? It didn't work all the time. I mean, sometimes I'd stand there and like nothing would happen, but <laughs> it's sort of the, the power of two. If one person stops, if one person notices you, they think you're weird. If another person joins you and notices you, they go, oh, that's interesting. If three, by the time you get three people, then then a crowd forms, and then I would start that way, and then I would interact with the audience. I had the kind of a, a, I call it a magnetic character. It was a, this little, I, I looked like a poor little doll that needed attention. I don't know. I, I don't know if it was my skill or if people felt sorry for me. One of the two, <laughs> but I seemed to have this ability to draw people into me, hmm. and that's when I started thinking. You know, there's different kinds of performers. I like the dynamic and the magnetic. There's people that go out there and just, you know, you, they just grab you like this. And other people that just sort of sit back and, and you want to draw into what they're doing and observe that. And they both have that power. And so my power became that of getting people to come towards me. And the act that you saw last night isn't my regular act. That's one that I've wanted to do for a long time. Oh, interesting. The other is a very, it's about a cleaning lady that finds happiness through a mop that comes to life. So people identify love and, and, and you know, wanting. So that is an act where people, it's like people are spying, like they're watching me have a private moment. Okay. You know, there's nothing, I love, like, if somebody's really loud, you don't want to hear it, but if you hear whispering in the next wall, you, you go over to the you wall lean to, listen. Over to listen. Right, so mm -hmm. that's that kind of thing, you know, and I found that that was where my power was. That's incredible. Yeah. Oh. Wow. <laughs> well, it's just, I mean, I think that, yeah, to be a performer, it's kind of this, like, yeah, you have to have a great amount of self-awareness because sometimes it's not about what you want to make, but mm -hmm. the kind of person you yeah. are to make the thing. And self-awareness, it doesn't, it t it's taking me a lifetime to find out who I am. You know, like, well, you said at the beginning, you said who you are and what you do. And I go, those two things are interchangeable for me. Yeah. Because you said earlier this really great thing. What, what did you say? You do this so you don't have to have a oh, job. Oh, yeah. So it ended up being, once I started going on the, performing on the street, I was very, I lived in a really small, I think I lived in a converted two-car garage. I didn't have any great, you know, wants, financial. I just wanted to be able to, to, to make enough that I don't have to rely on my parents or other people at all. So I made enough on the street to just do that, to pay my rent. And, but the street performer, that gets, once you decide that you don't want to do it anymore, it's the hardest thing to do because it takes so much mm. energy. But I was lucky that that was my exposure. That exposed me to, um, I was, I ended up being on some commercials and, um, doing private parties and that all worked out really well. So that was the start. And then there came a point where mime was not cool anymore. It was never really cool. <laughs> I was going to say. It was, no, because, okay, this, I'm talking the seventies. Okay. Robert Shields started this movement and I realized all this later because I wasn't the only one that was drawn to him. He did that, and a bunch of people decided they wanted to be mimes. So it became a menace, which is mimes everywhere. This is became, by the late 70s, it was just like, not another, you know, when I first started, they went, oh, what's that? By the time I got burned out, which was three years later, they go, oh, gosh, there's another one. Mm. <laughs> it really went that quickly. So I lost that. But thankfully, a visit to the Magic Castle in Hollywood turned another switch in me. It said, oh, I get it. First of all, I love the building. It was this old Victorian mansion that had been conven converted into a magic club. And I go, I got to work here. This is, I love this place. This is me. And didn't know why. Again, it's a bar and you have to dress up. And I, I don't drink and I don't like dressing up. So <laughs> this, what I was saying right from the beginning is that all these things, you know, the self-awareness thing. Yeah, but it doesn't just, you're not just self, it doesn't happen. It happens, but you have to bring it in and you have to shape it. So my love for wanting to be at the Magic Castle led me to, I called the Magic Castle the next day after my visit. And I said, I was a mime. 
I would, I'm interested in working the Magic Castle, and very nice at the time, he was a president at the time, said, well, you have to be a magician. And I went, oh, huh. <laughs> <laughs> really? Okay, let me... Do. So I started going to the magic shop, and I found for other friends that were... Men this is a private club, and there were members, and I go there, and I go, this is... This can work. Magic can be... I already saw mime as the other side of music, and now I could see magic as the other side of mime. It's, they're both dealing with illusions and creating creating illusions that, are, that feel real. So I got to just kind of be part of that group. And, and the magicians were very welcoming. They see they saw that I was a mime and that I really was devoted to that. And they started understanding me and how, and they were very helpful in helping me make those two things come together. We're talking, this is 45 years ago. Yeah, um, I was yeah. going to say, I feel like, because that's an interesting, that you say they're welcoming, because I, I mean, I don't know many magicians, but I feel like they can be maybe very guarded about their magic. Yeah, that is one thing. Yes, and we are. We don't want to just expose it. Right. But when we see someone potential, we want magic to grow. And magic right now is much bigger than it is when I was around. I mean, magic is really, thanks for, you know, to uh, America's Got Talent and other shows like that, magic is really big now. It's it's a really, it's a small enough world that there, there, that can exist. Like in the acting, dancing, uh, singing world, there's so much competition. Magic is nice and small, so we're always welcome people that we feel have, are, do, are truly and deeply interested. So that's a vibe that I got from other magicians. One of the guys that helped me out ended up being my husband, who's been my husband for 40 years. Oh, wow. So that kind of, that kind of kept me in it. And he's very generous to me and to, and that's how I've become now. Fortunately, if I see, someone who's getting started and I see that thing, that basic talent, but more importantly, the willingness to listen and the willingness to just put everything into it, knowing that it's not all, ah, you know, mm -hmm. that it, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of pain that we go through. I don't know if you've gone through that, but there's just a lot of Oh, yeah. There's a lot of pain. And you get physical pain. There's a lot of physical pain. I, yeah, what I've, kind of pain fortunately, do you mean? Fortunately, uh, emotional pain, because it's not only who I am, it's what I do. It's so mm. if I... If I do a performance where it just doesn't feel right, or if I feel that I've that the audience is like going, "Oh my God, this is boring." I mean, that's a big fear of mine. I, my big fear is boring the audience. So and it's also feeling the the feeling the the lack of creative ability. I just think, why can't I be more creative? This is this is what I do. This is what I'm devoted to. Why am I so stuck? I, I then I, that, that when that happens, I resort to people that I admire. Like there's, I heard. Uh, Alan Sorkin, the writer who writes these amazing things, his thing that he says, he says, writer's, writer's block is my default mode. <laughs> huh. And I thought, you know, if someone like Alan Sorkin can say that he has writer's block, then I can't, I shouldn't be so hard on myself that I'm not growing any more than I have. When, so for a writer, <clears throat> writer's block seems very obvious. Like you sit down and you don't mm -hmm. know what to write. Right. For a magician, mm -hmm. what's what happens? Well, first of all, I don't, I'm labeled as a magician, but I don't have that deep. Most magicians that I call, like my husband specifically, they started when they were nine years old and magic was like this. They're only, everything they saw, they wanted to turn in. They, it were magic. Yeah. They, there's a technical and psychological, technical right. and um, psychological come together in magic. That's, you need to have both. I don't have the aptitude for magic, but I have... Is the strong like desire. The well, I can't do a card trick. The, yeah. Okay. I mean, no, I have pretty good hands. Mm -hmm. The music has helped me with right. that. Yeah. But to me, my work is based on emotional content and I love to move. So put those two together. Like when you feel like you're not being creative oh, right, in the yeah. magic right. realm. Because, like that. because I'll try, I'll, I'll work on something and it just doesn't happen. I'll feel really good about something and then I'll get up the guts to show it to somebody else. And it kind of goes, uh, or if it goes, oh, that's, you know, there's more, uh, and you have to be ready for that. Uh -huh. like, and, and it's not like a negative thing, but, and, and let me go back to going back to music, because again, as a kid, I thought I was always going to be a musician. That was my goal. And I find with music, as much as I love it, um, cause I played the harp. I left that out too. For 30 years, I played the harp, <laughs> big concert <laughs> harp. That's why I'm downsizing to a uke. <laughs> Because that got very impractical. But you play music, and for the most part, people start talking as soon as you start playing. Right. But they start asking you questions. If I'm talking, if I'm playing an instrument, 
they'll immediately start asking me question me while I'm playing or they'll sing along or something, you know, and I go, you know, thank you, but uh, that's, that means I'm not doing my job. If I can't get someone to just be involved, then, or if I'm either boring them or if they can't hold their attention, then, right. And so that puts a lot of pressure on me. Yeah. Because it's, I mean, I think any great performer will tell you, anybody I admire will say, yeah, most of what you see is like the tip of the iceberg of all the work I've put into it. And I've accepted that. I finally accepted that. So basically, I just haven't created as much as I've had the opportunity to. I don't have excuses. You know, a lot of people say, I would do this, but, but I have kids or I have elderly parents or I have a job. I've had to, I don't, I've cleared all that stuff away. I have, I've never had kids. My parents are, have passed away. Um, I've been able to support myself financially, so I don't have to deal with that. I have a really wonderful supporting husband who, who's there. So I don't have any any barriers. And that's really terrifying because I don't have the excuses that a lot of people have. Gotcha. Yeah. And so you feel like you should be doing more. I should be better more. than I am, yeah. Oh, I think we all feel that way all the time. I know. In a way, I don't complain, certainly anymore, because that's what I need. But I've gotten better with myself since I started practicing yoga about 10 years ago, and I started teaching it about six years ago. That has given me a lot of... First of all, it's improved me physically, because by the time I was 40 and up to 50, I thought, oh, well, okay, so I'm getting getting old, I guess. Yeah. And I'm 70 now, and, you know, I feel great. You're 70 years old? (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> so that, I go, you know, I've just bought myself some extra time. So I'm really happy about that. Yeah. Yeah. And with your extra time, you're performing all around I'm, the world. I'm, uh, yeah, it's not constantly. And I wouldn't, I've seen performers that do that all the time constantly. And I don't envy that. Mm-hmm. So it's balanced out. I don't have to perform anymore. I, but I, I love it, but I don't need it right now in this part of my life. Got and I didn't think, I, you know, when I was 20, I thought, well, I'm 30, I'll be, and I thought, oh, 40, that'll be, <laughs> and then 50, and then I thought, oh, six, 65, absolutely, I'm going to let my hair go gray, that's it, 65. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, as long as people ask me to be something like this, and, and I, and I really feel good about it, then I just do it, but I'm not, I'm not obsessed with it. What was your first act at the Magic Castle? I was uh, the, the little doll that I did. Uh, I was a, I was a Raggedy Ann doll, and I really liked doing mechanical movements. So because of I'd seen Robert Shields, and my character was kind of a sympathetic, shy character. So the doll thing worked well. People wanted to, and I would do a thing where I would fall onto the ground into the splits, and I would get <sighs> a guy to come help me stand up, and I would be crawling all over him, to, you know, as part of the doll and. Uh, so that was really fun. And then, so I was already doing that act on the street. So when I got into magic, the logical thing was to add magic to that. Right. So yeah, I added magic that to that act. What was your first magic trick you ever did? Uh, multiplying eyeballs. I know that's really weird, but you know, there's a multiplying ball trick. So yeah, multiplying ball, you know, you have a ball. And, oh, and then, then, then more balls. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, got it. Got so it, got I it. used to do this really weird thing. Um, I'm going to move your, your hair well. your, 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 Podcast members will not see this, but <laughs> that's you okay. have to ex- explain. So I have this thing that I can do with my eyes. It's just, oh, that's the other thing about. Um, I always tell people that that whatever you did when you were a kid that was really weird, that's going to go into your career. <laughs> For example, this is what I could do. Whoa! So she's crossing one eye, and the other one is like, right. And I can't do it with the other eye. But but <laughs> as a doll, I did. I would do this, you know, like crossing like this uh-huh. and then keeping it going like that <laughs> and coming back. Yeah. And then like that. And then uh, something would happen and, and my eye would fall out and that would be like a, a, a multiplying oh. ball. Ah, uh, I see. So I'd put the eye back in. And then, this is so gross to discuss, but <laughs> it would appear in my mouth. See, I, I, I look, I think about this. I go, this, this is so weird. It would That's appear in my mouth. It's like it a little w- grotesque. Uh, yeah, it is. Get... But hey, it yeah. got me into the magic castle. There you go. <laughs> so appear in my mouth, and then they would keep coming out of my mouth, and I would have like um, eight balls. And there was a little box here. I'd throw them in the box. It said spare parts. And out of the box <laughs> would come a big ball, and that was a floating ball. You've probably seen the floating ball. Yeah. So basically, I adapted standard magic tricks to that. Cool. So 
I was still doing this act when I was in my 30s. I was mid-20s to mid-30s. And I'm going, gosh, you know, when I'm 40, this is going to look really <laughs> weird. It's like coming out like a doll. It's like, don't do this to me. And it was that was one of the hardest times in my life, too, my performing life, because I was really loved performing. I really got hooked on it. But I said, I can't be doing this when I'm 40. This is like, really, it's like, if you saw them, there was a movie called... Uh, whatever happened to Baby Jane? Oh yeah, yeah. I'd but you are in that jam. Yeah. What is it, Blanche? Is it like you are in that? Jam? I don't know, but it was Betty Davis mm-hmm. trying to look like a little girl, and I go, God! I, I went into a complete panic when I saw that movie. <laughs> <laughs> and and then I always thought, well, I've always wanted to do like a, as a cleaning lady. I always found that fascinating. So I thought, how am I going to do a cleaning lady? Because you can be any age if you're a cleaning lady. So, True. Because you know, as I told you earlier, I was always thinking ahead how what am i gonna be when i'm older when i'm 40 whatever 50 a cleaning lady's kind of ageless so i thought i should go in that direction but i couldn't nothing could happen i I, it wasn't happening that's when i say you're frustrated you go i know there's something in here but oh i know this feeling so well yeah Yeah. so just know that that's like an image is it because like yeah i'm dealing with this right now where i have like images or flashes of what i keep doing that yeah yeah Okay. Yeah. Oh, do you well, want some advice on that? <laughs> yeah, please. Okay. What do you do? What did you Here's do? Here's the advice I give. Tell me. Okay. You go you go into a dark into your room like very quietly, you close your eyes and you picture yourself without any barriers. You go, "Okay, what do I want to see? What am I where am I standing? Which way am I facing? Am I standing? Am I sitting? What do I have in my hand? One hand. What am I wearing? What's the music that's playing?" Uh-huh. And you start bringing all these things together. That's how this, the ring, the, the act that you saw was kind of like that. I want to be, I want to look nice and sleek. I want to have just one thing in my hand. I want beautiful music playing. Hmm. And but that was 15 years before I started this. I mean, that, it has to brew. So just know that, that's why I'm saying pay attention to all that weird stuff. Because at least one little part of that's going to make sense to you a lot later. Gotcha. These are the unexplainable things about life. It'll make sense later, I promise you. But just do that. Make a habit out of that. Of really, You have to visualize what you want to be or do or feel. It's all about feeling. And I know probably your work too. It's a very emotional connection you have. Yeah. And an audience, although they can't describe that, they'll sense it. Yeah. They'll, they'll be a part of you that they feel connected to. But that's really hard. It's really effortful. I, you know, hard is the wrong word. But that's the part that's frustrating because you want it now or you want it tomorrow and it might not hit you for 15 years. Oh, man. And that's where I'm lucky that I don't do a physical, uh, uh, that's, I, you know, I, I love aerialists. To me, I just can't even fathom it. But I think, wow, I'm, I was lucky in a way that I didn't have that physical ability. I wish I had things I wish I'd had. <laughs> I wanted to be a dancer so bad but I couldn't follow other people's steps and I just didn't have the physical strength. And so uh, it, mime was, mime saved me because I would have been a really bad dancer and my career would have been over by the time I was in my 20s. So mime, mime and magic have an ageless thing to, yeah. to it. So I got really lucky, lucky that what I wanted, I didn't get. I'm really interested in this like, <laughs> so you sit in, is this what you did with the cleaning lady? You sat in the room? You held them off? No, I, actually, okay, with the cleaning lady, um, I, I, I went, I just bought a bunch of stuff that would be cleaning stuff and I'd play around with it because you have to physicalize things. You, you ha- it has to be here, it has to be deep, but then you have to touch things. You yeah. have to move. You have to lock yourself in a room and just move. Yeah. Just trust yourself on that. And, and uh, with scarf and rings, yeah, I just, and, and I have a video, really funny video, of, well, not funny, but it wasn't really funny at the time. When I was working <laughs> on the rings, I was just moving them around. I had, di- I used different kinds of music, just moving around, just kind of free moving. Nobody was watching me, so it was okay. And then I had the video on this, I had a video camera on me, and I was doing like this, and I just let me go, <sighs> and I just sat like this, you know, with my head down. And then when I went to play the back the video, I went, you know, all that moving around was okay, but the most interesting part of that video was when I did this. You know, that, that kind of yeah, giving. Wow. I went, that got my interest to that whole thing that happens to you because we all feel that. Oh, my God. Totally. 
Yeah. And you want to do what people feel. You want to connect with what people feel. You know, an emotional connection is you can give people all kinds of information, tell them all kinds of facts, do all kinds of physical tricks, you know, handstands and things. But you have to do something that they can't do, but it has to be something they wish they could do. Ooh, and in their fantasies, good. they can. Yeah. 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 That's good. Yeah. <laughs> you have to do something they can't do. Yeah. Otherwise, why are they going to bother watching Absolutely. You? Yeah. But it has to be something. That's the know. worst. Like, I mean, it's never happened to me, but like that, when you get a heckler who's like, I can do that. Yeah. That kind of thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. I can imagine. And that's a good, if, hecklers give you the best fodder. You know, if you, if you get a, if a, somebody heckles you, then whatever they say can mean something a lot. You know, you, that's the thing, listening to everything. Yeah. Well, you're not going to get hecklers, right? No, I no. don't really, no. no. Um, but, but it, okay, let me rephrase that for our sake. Uh, <laughs> the audience, they, sometimes someone says to you something to you that seems really like weird, stupid. Yeah. That's really important. Why? To take that. Well, because it means that, that it, it can lead to a good idea. Any kind of comment, especially if it's really dumb, then that means it affected you. If someone says really something stupid to you, then that affected you emotionally. Right. You that you got to do something with that. Mm. Not now, not tomorrow, maybe ten years from now. But I'm saying that it's anything that grabs you emotionally, good or bad, has a significant meaning to who you are. Because mm. somebody might say something to the same thing to somebody else, and they go, they wouldn't even hear it. So, baby, back to the you, the word you use of self awareness. That's oh, those are, we're always finding that. I'm always waiting to hear. I'm always waiting for something, whether it's positive. You always like, you know, you love praise. You love it. That's like, that's our food. But, you know, <laughs> your, our vitamins are <laughs> um, when someone says something that seems really wrong to you. Can you uh, share an instance where this happened to you? <laughs> I'll say what happened to my, when I was saying that, I was saying something that happened to my husband. My husband does yeah. this act where he juggles coffee, a, a coffee, coffee cup. And he wears a suit, he wears a tie that has a big circle on it. After the, after he did, he does, he shows a coffee thing. It's, it's a hoop. The coffee goes up in the air and he catches it. And when he's done, he puts the coffee down and an audience member said, Hey, you have a spot on your tie. So now he does, he actually puts it in his act. He, after he juggles the coffee, he puts the coffee down and he looks at the circle. It's a, it's a design element. He looks at it and go, I got a spot on my tie. You know, so oh, things nice. like that. I, that, I, I happened to be thinking about that when I was saying that. So, uh, let me, if I think of something later, it's, it just happens so much all the time. I'm yeah, trying to think if anything sure. happened last night that would do that. But I'm saying it's really all about listening and then actively listening and knowing that anything anyone says to you, especially if you have an emotional reaction to what somebody says to you, the best ones are like when, you know, when I end with a rose in my mouth with the, that, yes, yes, yes. that was one of the biggest gifts ever. I had a friend, I have a friend who's a, he's a really good mime and he came over to help me once, uh, working when I was working on the rings. That's the other thing. Get help from others. Cause that was actually going to be, um, Oh my God. Oh, I don't want to interrupt your story. No, but that was going to be my like follow up question was like, it seems like you do a lot of like sit in the dark room, do the research, yeah. film oh. yourself, see what's interesting. Yeah. When do other people come in? Okay. When you've done all that. Okay. Dur during that. Mm. So I'd done that and I was working on it and I was just trying to work on the my moves. I wasn't thinking about anything else. And he's just a really great, generous friend. So he comes over and I'm doing this thing and, and he was listening to the music as I was doing it. And I, and I just, he says, you know, at the end of that, you should end up with a rose in your mouth. And that, those are the best ideas because you go, why didn't I think of that? That is so <laughs> obvious. There's two great ways. Um, when someone says something to you, you go, my God, what a simple thought and what a beautiful idea. Yeah. And those are gifts. Two seconds before that, he wasn't thinking, well, I'm going to suggest you do that just hit. That was one of those things that he just said that just. He wasn't even thinking about it. Right. It's, it's just hit him and goes, you should end up with a rose in your mouth. And I, I like that. When somebody tells you something and you get goosebumps, mm -hmm. I go, my God, that is so good. So that's when I went, you know, my husband and a few other, I have this, like this few people, a few, like three or four people that it, when I get an idea, I go to them and I go, I show them. That's the thing. You have to have something. You can't go, and like, this is a problem a lot of people have. They go, Oh, I want to work on an act. I'll just hire this guy to help me. Well, we don't have, if we want to help, we don't have anything to be our based on. But if you come with a clear idea and you can physicalize it to some degree, like, okay, rose in the mouth. How do I do that? So I went to this several people, 
I have my own ways of, you know, magicians hide things and they put the, they pull them out at the right moment so they look like they appear. Yes. Well, that I could sort of figure out. But I wasn't, and I knew the moves, you know, what do you, but with the help of them, the technical help of exactly right. how you're standing, exactly where you get the thing that you're hiding from, hiding from the audience, that's where you get the help. Yeah, interesting. But it's really crucial for people to know that you can't just go to somebody, especially you see a good act and you go, oh, would you help me come up with an act? It's like, no. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. But sure, if sure. you say, I've got this and I just need this, this mm -hmm. little tiny piece, and a lot of times they go, oh, yeah, why don't you just do that? It's so simple. Yeah. And those are the moments that you just treasure forever. Yeah. And when during my act, a lot of time, I do different things while I'm doing the, I have different things. Like sometimes I focus just on the breathing. Uh, sometimes I focus on just, you know, how far I want to What were you lengthen. focusing on last night? Probably surviving. <laughs> <laughs> last night, no, last night I had a few little technical difficulties, which, you know, that happens. But um, on the first night, I just want to get through it. And I just don't want to, like I saw that, the, the hand, hand balancer guy, and I went, I can't go on stage after that. Oh, yeah, she's <laughs> lovely. I yeah. know, and I go, he's doing that, and I'm just going to be waving some rings and a <laughs> scarf around. Oh, my God, can I go home now early? I mean, those are the things I go through. Can I just go home It's right so now? nice to hear that someone <laughs> of, like, your experience goes through that, it's too. Forever. Because I definitely have had that experience. And it's, you know what, it's like, a good oh thing. Because you see people that have a super ego, and they go, oh, I can... There was one performer, no, I shouldn't say that. There was a performer last night that had that super ego that nothing scares him. Mm. And I like people that are just a little scared up there because that brings energy to what you do. Oh, I love that. You know, there's overconfident people that are boring because they just say, hey, I know what I'm doing. Here's my, my rub with magic, especially card tricks. I don't care. I don't know how to do a card trick, but I really don't care that you can find my card if I tell you my... The, you know, you say, pick a card, here's your card. And you take five minutes to find my, you know, I knew that you knew what it was right when I said it. Right. Why do you have to go through all this stuff? Yeah. And that's why I never really got into that kind of magic because I know, like, I know those rings are going to link and unlink. Uh -huh. So it's my job to have it happen when you don't know it's going to happen. Yeah. So I'm already in that act. I'm already doing stuff a lot of people have seen. In the cleaning lady, it's a little different because it's so there's so much emotional content. If you want to check it out on YouTube, you can. It's it's a bunch of people have posted it, so it's awesome. Tina Leonard YouTube. Yeah, um, and we'll put a sh uh, link in the show notes yeah, they for want. everybody yeah. out there. Yeah, so there's different videos of what I've done. So it's not I'm not trying to fool people. I just want them to feel it, to be surprised, and to kind of feel that nice sense, that, that sweet sense inside of them. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. When I breath is some, I found breath means everything i see like tonight I'll, I'll focus on the breast last night i just wanted to i was hoping the lights worked which they did mm -hmm. and i was hoping i wouldn't i made a few little mistakes but i had to forgive myself and nobody um, noticed well it's not i didn't notice. again no but here's the thing no it's not about noticing it's just that there was a few things that didn't happen that they could have happened you know what i'm saying is that little subtleties like if you saw the act again you probably wouldn't remember that i but it's have not you ever had a perfect run no, no. ever I've never walked off stage thinking, I nailed it. There's always one little thing. Ugh. Yeah. Why do you do that too? Um, I've had, I think I had one time where I was like, I nailed that. Oh yeah. But, but it's not, it's certainly not your default mode. No, God, no. <laughs> oh, not at all. No. Yeah. Last time I felt good. I thought the audience was really nice. And that always helps. You know, if the audience it was really is good audience. watching, it was, a good show. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. It was. But no, I always go, oh, I wish that and again, I don't, I'm not hard on myself for that because I, I do, I don't want to be per perfection is boring, but mm. I want to be there and I want everything, I want the audience to feel what I feel. And if I make a mistake, it's not they're going to notice, they're not going to notice a mistake, but they're just, that's one moment they're going to lose. Yeah. See, I'm there for six and a half minutes, seven, okay, I'll say seven minutes to round it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's my, I, every second needs to count. So if I, if I just, miss something that's one thing that they're not going to get that i've deprived them of so yeah i deprived one little thing that i really love to do but that happens and i can't really beat myself up that's so interesting because when i'm watching you you it, it reads like and i've watched um the other person who there's a woman she's french her name's fanny kerwich and she's 
from an old circus family mm-hmm. and she's a hula hooping act that she's mm-hmm. probably been doing for 40 years. Mm-hmm. It's great. And every moment in that act is choreographed. You can tell yeah. she's done it right. that right. many and times. And I've done what I do a lot of times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's Repetition. kind of like, it got, I got that sense of like every single moment, every head turn, every glance. Like yeah, you it's have all, the yeah. timing, you have everything in that. Um, how do you keep it fresh or how do you stay present? I play with it a lot. Yeah. And I have the tolerance for that. Some people have to change every night and I'm envious of that, but that's not me. I'm not, I'm, I'm a, I'm a fixer. Like I want to tweak everything. That's just who I am. Yeah. Again, who I am, what I do. Some people, if they could only do six, I've seen people that are brilliant, but if they're on stage for six minutes, you go, what was that about? Mm -hmm. Because they need a good 45 minutes. Oh, wow. I can, I have a, like a, a seven minute thing. I've never been able to do anything longer than seven minutes that actually could sustain an audience. So that is who I am. I'm not saying that's great. I wish I could have, I wish I had a one and a half hour or even an hour one person show that would widen my possibility. I don't have it. And do you and your husband never work together? <laughs> no. <laughs> cool. We, our marriage is more important than that. We're really, we're very similar. I mean, we get along really well. We really have fun with each other. But on stage, we have no chemistry together. Interesting. I have chemistry with other performers, like with the mime that I was telling you about and the guy that I was telling you about that can do an hour and a half show. Yeah. We have, we, we do, I play the harp while he, he does some fun stuff and we just, we just really connect on stage. Uh huh. But Mike and I tried to do stuff together and it just, it, it was just ruining us. Yeah. That's so And interesting. you don't know that until you do it. Sure. And when we finally both, we both agreed adamantly, but yet we really, it, it's great if we're on the same show. Because yeah, that's we should, what, like, I mean, like. And last year he was with me. So it was nice okay. because we can watch each other or we can do the tech part of it. So it's a really good support or if, you know, if, if I see something in him or if he sees, he says, you know, what, what about when you did, and you know, we really, encourage each other and critique each other so yeah it's good for that but and you know it's just nice because this this is also human conditioning if a man and a woman are working on stage the woman's considered the assistant that's kind of what happens right and our both of our egos are a little bit too strong for that (laughs) (laughs) no i'm I'm an independent i'm a loner and i feel that it's my i i love working with other people but i also need to feel that i can do it myself so I don't have to depend on other people. I can totally If you work with a that. partner, the other part, you usually don't have the same desire. You know, one partner will say, oh, I'm just doing it because it's a, or the other one just can't wait to do the next show. Or, and, you know, it's, anyway, it worked out for the best to answer your question. Yeah, us, sure. I've seen, and I wouldn't want my professional and personal life to be so tied together. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't know how these acts do it. These, these couple acts that they, they're together 24 hours. I need my solitude, and so does he. Yeah. And I need to other, exp- and I, this this is really good for me to get out to do things on my own. So it, it worked out for the best. But Very it took cool. a while to discover that. Very cool. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. All right. So it's at about 42 minutes. Mm-hmm. So I want to wrap up, but is there anything else that you, I have one more question. Yeah, please. Which I always ask at the end. My last question mm-hmm. is what advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? Um, I would say be more patient with yourself and be more daring. Don't be afraid to fail so much. Huh. My biggest fear is boring. I think I think the worst crime a, a performer can do is... Oh, in fact, I think... Was it Sorkin that said the same thing? He says, the worst thing that a writer can do is tell the audience something they already know. Uh. <laughs> I'll translate that to my work. And I am so afraid of boring the audience. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And so I wish I wasn't so afraid. I wish I was just a little more careless than I am. And I wish I was just a little less, um, I love being an intro. I finally decided that being an introvert, I figured that out that that's, that's my label (laughs) that I love it because I know, because that means I'm willing to take the time to develop a skill. So that's the good part. And I don't make any rash mistakes about, you know, I don't do things, I don't do things, um, impulsively because imp- impulse can be work against you too but i wish i had a little more of that i wish i would have developed that i wish i would have been a little less afraid to show people my work 
or just show, hey, you know, just say, hey, what do you think of this? Or, or just to get up on stage doing something that I'm not quite sure of. But again, at the, at the same time, I go, well, no, I don't want to get up on stage and bore people. So that's, I don't want, I want to keep my that's responsibility. The fear that... Yeah, but it's a, it's a good fear because I can't stand it. I feel if, when I see a performer that I think is not, that, that has a lot more confidence than, than ability, I go, you've just robbed a half an hour of my life <laughs> that I will never get back. Yep. <laughs> and I don't want to be the person that robs people of their time because time is so valuable. So I'm proud of it in a way, but I just wish I was a little more gutsy, a little less afraid to, to be out there. That's, that's the one regret I have. But it's not, but it has double sided, you know? Always. It's yeah. the strengths are your weaknesses. Yeah. No, I say, okay, there's a, um, you hear, and I hear, I hear it more than I want to. You say, do you do what you want? You can do anything you want if you put your mind to it. You can, have you heard that a lot? Yeah. Like, that's not entirely true. What you want isn't always, it, it doesn't always happen just the way you want it. In fact, it never does. And it can be very frustrating. You know, so if you want to be an astronaut, you just put your mind and you'll be. You might be an astronaut, but it doesn't mean you're going to be the top astronaut. It doesn't mean I'm going to be the top mime, the top uh, harpist, the top ukulele player, the top guitarist, all these things that I wanted to do. I've always just kind of hovered. And at some point you have to say, that's okay. Mm. Because we don't always have that deep talent, that deep given, nature given, God given, whatever you want to call it, that takes to get what you think you want to be. Mm -hmm. So, and there's twists and turns. I had no idea I wanted to be a magician, and I still don't think of that. <laughs> I never have any idea of what's going to happen. I just know that I have to be open, and I have to know this is me. I can't be somebody else. I can't be as good as somebody else. And to not get, not let that beat you up. Mm. Be because it's probably not going to happen, but you still, there's another, I mean, remember Mike Rowe, the guy that does the dirty, dirty jobs thing? No. He, he did a, a cable TV show called Dirty Jobs. Okay. His thing was to go around different people's jobs that um, they're really nasty, what they're like and what they're like. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I can't remember. But anyway, it's involved getting dirty and doing weird stuff. He wanted to be an <laughs> opera singer. He did? Yeah, he did. And it just wasn't going to happen. But yet, he, as a result of his not being able to get what he wanted, he got something that was far more interesting and certainly more commercial because he did really well on that show. Mm. And he says, you can't always follow your passion, but you need to put passion into everything you do. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I thought that was, that's something that I live by. I go, okay, I can't be the world's greatest, whatever. I, I don't know what I want to be now, <laughs> but <laughs> I just want to make sure that everything I do, I just do with all my heart because that's what matters. It matters to me and it matters to anyone that I come in contact with. And I like people that, that's why I want to be, um, I want to be somebody that I want to be friends with or that I want to know. Yeah. And I want to know people that are really passionate about what they do and they just love life and they just know that there's always something around the corner that they don't know about yet. They're yeah. going to discover whether it makes them famous or, or just makes them love life more. That's great. That's so I'm going to end it there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tina. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time because it, it's good for me too. That was my interview with Tina Leonard. I loved talking to Tina, especially when we got into the creative aspects of performing. I felt like even though we had completely different performance art forms, a lot of her approach really resonated with me and some of the approaches that I take when I'm creating an act. One thing that Tina does that I didn't do or have never done is, but I want to try, um, is sitting in, into a room, sitting in a dark room, um, and visualizing what you want the mood of your act to be, how you want to feel, what images come to mind, what music you want, want to play. Then Tina suggests you've got to put it on its feet. Obviously, you have to work with your props, your apparatus, or whatever you use and film it because sometimes, she says, the mistakes or the things you didn't mean to do are the most interesting parts. Then you have to recruit friends or experts, people who do what you do, who you trust to give you honest and helpful feedback uh, to improve your craft. And then you practice. 
You practice until you know every gesture, every music cue, every moment in your act. If you want to view one of Tina's acts, I put it in the show notes. It's the Cleaning Lady Act, and it's on YouTube. Tina was also super helpful in lending her advice to my latest act. If you want to see sneak peeks of that, as well as aerial training tips and information, you can follow me on Instagram at the underscore artist underscore athlete. I'm also on Facebook, The Artist Athlete, and my website is theartistathlete.com. Thanks for listening, friends, fans, and enemies. I will talk at you next week. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Aloha, my name is Beth Russell and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slacklining, pole, bungee and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and slings and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus, and um, that's why I'm Patreon. Hello, all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete Podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in the cities, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and goodbye.